Welcome back. Hi, I'm Ashley, uh, CEO and co-founder of HD Agency and uh, today we're going to be talking about identifying talent hubs across the UK. Um, I'm glad to say I'm joined by uh, Joshua Simpkins from Sanderson. Um, Josh, do you want to just introduce and tell us what you do at Sanderson? Yeah, sure. So I have worked for Sanderson for around nine years and in that time the majority of my time has been spent in, in digital and technology recruitment. So I head up our tech practice and we recruit uh, UK wide for a wide range of different companies from big corporates all the way down to sort of early stage startups and scale ups. Um, and yeah, 11 UK offices, big team and probably got a lot you know, to talk about UK wide tech delivery. Absolutely, and then there's obviously um, just in terms of the sense and structure a little bit that you can lean on in terms of the experience of the group in Australia as well. Um, so could you just tell a bit about, us a bit about uh, your position in Australia and what you guys do there? Yeah, sure. So we, we've been on a bit of an acquisition mission over the last sort of four or five years. So we've um, acquired a number of recruitment companies, some of which were based uh, in Singapore, in Hong Kong and Sydney. Uh, which has allowed us to, to sort of soft land in, in those regions and, and uh, some of them have been rebranded in partnership with Sanderson. Um, so Hyams and uh, Nakama were two brands that were quite big over there and then now Nakama Sanderson uh, mixed. But yeah, we've, we've, we've been uh, picking up quite a lot of new tech business uh, in, in Sydney and, and further afield in Australia in recent time. Great stuff, great stuff. And in terms of um, what you do here in the UK, obviously we've known each other for, for, for a couple of years now. Um, in terms of how you're supporting uh, startups and this fast growth scale ups, what, what sort of experience have you been doing with those companies here? So it's, it's a bit of an interesting one in terms of where they are on that journey. So uh, the, the companies we work with, some of them are quite early stage. So across the UK, we've got quite a lot of different. Um, different investment uh, initiatives, a, a few different programs that support very early stage start startups get money and usually from a, from a talent and recruitment perspective our benefit, our value add comes when they have funding and they need to grow their teams. So uh, it varies massively, I mean some of them are, are series A to series C and you know we're trying to scale and hire 100 people in, in a 6 to 12 month period. Um, and obviously to do that with an internal talent team or internal HR team can be a real challenge so often they'll come to someone like us to look at mapping out how they can do that through to you know businesses that are looking just at long-term strategy around how they're going to build a bit of a sustainable talent plan that could be partnering with universities through mm. uh, like you know early stage getting getting graduate programs set up so they've got a, a pipeline of candidates coming through, yeah. uh, through to exec hires if, they, if there's strategic changes in the business, um, you know, and then, and then your business as usual type, type activities. Awesome, awesome. And then that's one of the reasons why um, Josh is here today in terms of the work that he's been doing with startups and scale-ups on a national scale here in the UK. He's really well placed in terms of helping businesses that are looking to land here in the UK kind of strengthen uh, that sort of longer term strategy piece as well. We know obviously about when Australian businesses are, are looking to land here, it's a strategic hire. Uh, one or two is kind of sales directors and, and delivery functions. But that longer term ambition I think is, is something that is really important to cover right from the get-go from that sort of strategic land. Um, so in, just in terms of the webinar, what we're going to be into today. So just a bit of an overview really of the, the kind of UK uh, talent scene at the moment within technology. So some really interesting stats that have come out from Tech Nation recently. Um, there's currently uh, close to 5 million people that are employed within the kind of digital tech um, uh, industry here in the UK already. That's up massively from 2011, uh, from 2000, uh, sorry, from 2.1 million in 2011. So there's been a massive, massive surge in growth and interest and people coming into the sector, both in technical roles and, and sort of non-technical roles as well. So it's a really interesting space within the UK. Uh, it's one of the fastest growing tech hubs uh, within Europe. Um, it's one of the highest in terms of potentially for, for investment. There's a lot of, of, of brilliant sort of perfect conditions coming together that make the UK uh, a brilliant place to, to kind of stop and land uh, in terms of accessing both the UK market and the European market as well. So what we're going to do um, as part of this webinar and assisted by Josh, um, obviously as the, the, the sort of man in the know, the thought leader, we're going to be sort of discussing a couple of things. Uh, we're going to be looking at some of those geo hotspots in the UK. So 
some of the misconceptions that we've definitely experienced with uh, Australian business coming into the UK. Uh, it's London centric, you have to be in London and that is absolutely the case for, for some things um, and it, it, it's got a time and a place but there is a lot that's going on um, across the UK. So we had a uh, fintech um, uh, sort of mission that came to the UK. We uh, were um, introducing them to Scotland and Edinburgh and some of the um, activity that's happening in Cardiff with the um, FinTech Wales accelerators and programs that are there as well. So there are lots of ways to access the UK um, in terms of the market and also in terms of talent outside of London where it's slightly less competitive. Um, and obviously we're in a really interesting space here in the UK at the moment, or I say interesting, really challenging space, uh, particularly around talent with uh, all the economic and kind of social political uh, issues or challenges that are going on at the moment that um, strategically placing yourself in an area where you are deeply engaged in the community and you can access talent is really, really important uh, without having to pay ridiculous wages and salaries. I think that's, that's one point. So we're going to be looking at some of those, those uh, hotspots in the UK. Then we're going to go uh, and sort of reflect on some of Josh's experiences and the sort of win on talent um, and some of those tips and advices, uh, tips and pieces of advice that Josh can give us around how to attract and retain talent. Um, particularly interested in, in terms of your thoughts on that actually. And then obviously uh, reflecting on that, looking at the importance of employer brand and that's definitely something that I've seen um, as a marketeer becoming vitally important uh, as a competitive edge within, within the talent field. So just to go back to the start then, what we'd like to sort of start with you Josh is um, if you could just tell us a little bit more about the kind of those hotspots outside of, uh, of London that sort of businesses should be looking at um, as, as areas of interest if they're looking to land here in terms of accessing talent. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's an interesting one and it is very broad in mm. terms of you know, cyber, fintech, aerospace, yeah. engineering, oil and gas, you know, there's, there's a whole load of different uh, areas that you could look at all with probably different focus points. So it's probably worth mentioning that I'll give you a bit of an overview like from a broad, a broad level, but the main, I suppose, focus point is that there's a whole lot going on outside, outside yeah. of London as a focus. Um, Especially when you look at uh, you know some of the some of the government you know government backed um, areas like cyber you know outside in the southwest in, in Bristol southwest of England yeah you've got a huge amount of the government uh, based cyber um, hotspots and as a result of that you've got then defence companies uh, in the UK that have chosen those locations also to base their cyber teams. And ultimately, then linking with universities, you then create a, a fairly sizable ecosystem around one location that is completely out in out in the in the southwest countryside of England and and nowhere near uh, sort of London. Cheltenham's a really interesting one, obviously, with um, the sort of cyber triangle that there's, that's up there at the moment. Obviously, GCHQ are the main pull factor. But there's a lot that's going into uh, cyber around Cheltenham. Again, to reflect on the the sort of the last trade mission we did with Austrade, it was all around cyber companies. Um, we went to Plexo in London, uh, we did some activities in Manchester, um, uh, linked to Plexo and a few other things. GCH, GCHQ, which I can always struggle with saying quickly, um, in Cheltenham, there's a lot that, there's almost that satellite effect, isn't there? There's a major employer and um, uh, in, in the UK government there. And what you just said there in terms of like those satellite industries and companies that are popping up around it in order to service those those contracts, but also to access that talent pool that's, that's there already is really, really interesting. And we we see that right across the UK, I suppose. And I think you sort of, I can see in your notes, I'm sort of jumping slightly ahead of you there. In terms of fintech, um, there seems to be quite a few fintech hubs popping up in the UK, but obviously Scotland and Edinburgh uh, being one of the more traditional ones that we, we know of, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at Scotland, you've got, historically uh, you know some big banks that have been based up there and then they tend to be a natural hotspot for, for you know for, for some of the early stage companies when when they're looking to, to go there the banking market in the UK has been an interesting one because they've moved from historically being very London centric to then go into more of a regional digit like especially when you look at digital and tech and you're hiring you know if you if you're looking for software engineers data engineers DevOps uh, product based people uh, they've moved more to uh, remote bay, you know, to, to regional hubs for mm. tech. Um, JP Morgan, Barclays, NatWest, Lloyd, some of the you know the big, big banks that you know that we all, all know in the UK um, have, have, have followed that model. And what we've ended up with is then big sort of regional hubs uh, across Leeds, Manchester, Bristol, Cardiff, 
and it, up in Scotland, uh, where you've got you know really really big bases of of, of, of fintech businesses targeting. Um, twinned with that, you've also got uh, more more so in your space with the whole ecosystem and and um, community driven partners and, and organizations that are maybe non-profit that drive like fintech north fintech mm-hmm. west um you know that just try and drive drive growth in those regions and and some of those organizations uh have done a, an amazing job really in the last probably five ten years of really increasing awareness of of, of that region and and bringing uh, investment in um so yeah so outside of london london remains you know for finance number one I think it always will be if you're ever a company trying to raise it you always end up going down to London at some yeah, point or of course being in touch with investors there but there, there's a whole you know whole ecosystem of of, of, uh, of not only talent but you know pretty promising businesses outside of that in all the regional hubs yeah absolutely and in, and in terms of uh, sort of compensation rates and salaries and things as well it, it does it makes for interesting reading in terms of some of the job roles you mentioned there in terms of DevOps and, and um, software engineers, etc. The difference between salary band in London to some of those hubs, uh, particularly in the southwest and, and, and the north, um, it's very, very different, right? The, you know, I, I don't have any figures to reflect on, but just knowing in terms of some of the, the, the work that we do with, with companies across the UK, there is quite a, a difference between the, between the two, right? You can, you can certainly save, yeah. I think the interesting result of the, and it's probably one to touch on when we look at you know, how to retain talent and, mm. and attract people in terms of the flexibility options that you're offering as a business. Um, but as a result of the, the pandemic in the UK market, as with, as with everywhere else, everyone went remote, and the remote hybrid working model is, is pretty much here to stay. Yeah. Now, the, the positive, I think, from a regional perspective has been that there's a lot of candidates who have, who have done fully remote, have decided that you know, it's probably not their first choice now and are mm. moving back to regional, regional presence, but it's, it's not ever going to be the way it was before where people are full-time on site. So the, the, the plus point of that is that when we look to attract people for, for when we're doing a scale-up project, um, if, if we've got flexibility, say, for, to have someone in the office one day a week or for a team meet up on site, you know, once a week, uh, you know, you, you, you still focus your searches for talent around an area, but you can be much more flexible on how far out from an area. So you could probably go up to, you know, for, one, for, for a few times a month, most people within 75 to 100 mile radius of a location are probably willing to get on the train and come in, um, which, which is good because it means that we can move more towards a, a regional based salary banding point uh, because over the lockdown we had you know I, I remember sitting there in lockdown and, and losing out to jobs in Bristol for yeah. a candidate in Scotland and things like that so yeah we're moving back to more regional regional hubs and, and that ultimately means that um, for certain roles you know you, you'll be able to save save money compared to central London yeah. rates as well and obviously we are gonna we're gonna sort of touch on on sort of um, attracting and retaining but just just to that point in terms of that flexibility uh, and obviously remote access, there is that the kind of great return back to the office that is billed and headlined as uh, in, in the UK. Um, but particularly with how challenging the tech market is, is that still a major play for, for, for businesses, that flexibility, that, that strictly 100% remote um, uh, working? Or are we starting to see the sort of, you know, the dials turning back a little bit to the good old days when we used to come to the office nine to five? It's, it's a controversial one, and mm. I think from my view of the delivery and partnerships we've got with live, you know, live scale-up projects that we're trying to deliver on at the moment, um, the flexibility fact, the, the businesses that have been more flexible have been more successful, in, in, yeah. in, especially when you look at the top, I don't know, 10% of, of, of DevOps engineers or data engineers in particular, where yeah, yeah. everyone's competing. I mean, we've even been contacted by we're quite lucky, I think, in the UK that we're blessed with a very rich talent pool of tech specialists, tech and digital specialists. Mm. Um, we've also benefited, um, you know, from the, you know the, the government offered in Hong Kong with all the uh, you know all the the unrest that was going on there. They offered the BNO visa scheme. We yeah. have a lot of really brilliant tech tech people have come across uh, and relocated to the UK as a result of that. So the fintech scene. We've placed a lot of people in the fintech space who have come over as a result of that. Yeah. Um, similar to the situation in Ukraine, a lot of uh, outsourced, uh, you know, tech hubs, a lot of outsourced uh, uh, offshore uh, software development sites. We're in, we're in Ukraine, Poland, 
um, and a lot of people there with, with the government offering have come over and relocated here. So we've, we've got a really rich um, pool of people, but if you are targeting that top percentage, mm. um, you, do, you do have to compete with a lot of other businesses who are trying to hire. We've even been contacted by uh, companies in Europe, yeah. in, in uh, Sweden and, and, and further afield that are trying to target UK-based talent and offer remote-based jobs. Yeah. So uh, it, there's a lot of competition, but I think as long as you're flexible and uh, we can go into you know some of the things that I think from a regional perspective you can you can do. Um, I think if you if you be, if you do manage to secure some regional presence, even if that's a satellite office or some sort of uh, soft landing space mm. that you can tie yourself to that location, yeah. you can generally build out an attraction model around that. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's interesting in terms of like uh, we're sort of blending subjects, so we're, we're sort of touching on around our attraction. But just to the point in terms of the UK hotspots, there we, we sort of read a report. Um, uh, not too long ago, and it was sort of the impact on COVID on some of these regional tech hubs and the sort of major exodus from London, um, and the fact that people are looking for a better quality of life, and um, you know the ability to work remotely, I suppose, is is part of that as well. If they can work for a, a you know financial services company in Edinburgh, but based in Bristol or based in Devon or where it might be. That's also quite interesting. So it, it seems that over the last couple of years, we've always had competition and there's always been investments. We have fast growth businesses that are sort of popping up um, more so around the UK now, so thanks to uh, the kind of leveling up agenda. Um, but it seems to become, it has become very complex because we're now having to deal with remote working, multi or international uh, companies looking to hire UK talent to work remotely from the UK, etc. So it's kind of a real bit of a complex minefield, which is, again, going to go into it in, in a little bit in terms of employer brand and advice in terms of how to attract and retain the top talent. But it seemed, uh, you know, I, I would hate to be in your hot seat for the last couple of years in terms of what's happening because I think it's become, you know... It's been a constantly moving, moving market, yeah. yeah. But I think, you know, the businesses that have been successful are those that, um, when you look at that, that, that sort of flexibility, have not defined a process around this is, you know, this is exactly what we expect. Yeah. Three days in the office, you know, that's it. Sort of black and white. You, there's no, you know, there's no other options. Mm. And um, you know, for those people, you might find, I don't know, a superstar candidate that wants, that could do everything you want and could yeah. be a massive asset to you, but only wants to come in one or two days a week. And if that doesn't fit, sometimes the HR sit, set up can can be a blocker. Yeah, going yeah. well, you know, they can't do what we've defined. And I think that can be a miss for, for some businesses. Yeah. Um, so I think if, if there's you know if you if you can be flexible around certain things and take an approach where you're looking at specific types of hires and the approach needed for those, you know you, you, you can make it work. Excellent, excellent. So that, that kind of leads us nicely, I suppose, onto onto our next subject. So it's to sort of build the win on talent, and effectively it's it's me asking you for for tips and advice on how to attract and retain talent. Um, and the best talent as well. So we've kind of touched on the points around competition and remote and some of the, the kind of market con uh, conditions that are there at the moment. But from a from a sort of new business coming into the UK, uh, with you know starting at kind of uh, sort of ground level, what are the kind of fundamental tips or advice that you would give uh, to, to to a founder or to a head of people that's coming in looking to to to, to develop a UK office? Yeah, absolutely. So I, th I think. If you're starting with maybe a limited con consumer brand, if you're new to the UK market, then you, you know I would probably look to focus on on the local, um, the local employer brand more mm. more so. Um, and I think there was a few points we, we sort of were, were going to cover. You know the the basics of money compensation. You need to be aligning to market rates. You need yep. to do your research and make sure that that's sensible. That's that's pretty much a given. Um, in terms of I suppose branding as a company and what you represent and being clear that you're, um, you know, most people these days, it's a given that they want to work for companies that are inclusive and therefore diverse. Yeah. Um, so, you know, th those things again are, are quite basic and fundamental, but in terms of uh, how you can approach that to, to, to start attracting people from day one, it's probably a, a, a multi-pronged approach. So yeah. I think you need to be you need to be probably engaging with some sort of some sort of local partners on the ground. So whether that be with you know people like you guys to generate uh, market information on what they're doing, um, the basics of you know 
LinkedIn advertising, job board advertising, if you've got an internal talent um, specialist or if you're working, working with a recruitment partner, making sure across all um, channels that you're going out on that, that the messaging is really clear, yeah. what you're about, what the purpose is, you know, and, and being making sure that the, there's a real clear opportunity of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think so many people get get the, even with ads and stuff like that, it get, we see it so many times where I work with a company and I look at their ads and I, you know, it's, it's for, for us, we sort of guide them through that process and end up, you know, getting people, getting people interested. But yeah. I think I sometimes see an ad and we, we sometimes will rewrite an ad mm. just because some of the really great things that they, they have that they it's should be telling there. everyone. It's, it's not clear. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, they could do all the work on their website and making all that good, but and then they could go and post an ad which is, you know, really, really basic yeah. and not very interesting. And the the um, I mean, you you guys know from the 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 hit rates and likes and everything else. You know, they'll probably get a really really poor response rate on that, mm. and it's it's a massive undersell on what they could be doing. Yeah, I think that's I think it's a really uh, quite an interesting one, obviously. From a marketing perspective and, and a recruiter experience, um, I think some of the some of the things that we've we've kind of worked with uh, brands coming into the UK from Australia and New Zealand and such was you only get one sort of crack at a crack at it really, given the conditions and given how competitive it is. And you know, if you're a, a developer worthy of any any notes, there are multiple options and routes that you could take um, if you're looking to attract getting that foundations and those fundamentals right. And, ready to go to market and sort of communicating that brand is really, really, really essential. Um, and there's a whole, you know, it's a whole thing that, that should be done in terms of when businesses are looking to, looking to come here, researching the market and understanding what people are looking for. So I think it's really, it's, there's been an interesting shift over the last couple of years and we're probably, um, just because of the nature and the culture that's, that's within the city that we are at the moment in Bristol, we are kind of exposed to it quite a lot. But in terms of what kind of tech talent they're looking for, there's a whole shift towards kind of impact-led things. It's not necessarily about the salary. It's about working for a purpose. It's about being part of something. And you can only build that feeling and that, that sort of identity around your, your brand and your employer brand uh, by, by doing it properly the first time and building that. And I think there's, there's a the really important point that you mentioned as well in terms of community engagement. And it's something which we've, we've kind of touched on a couple of times uh, as, as, as part of this webinar series. But... I do think community engagement, it sounds very fluffy and very woolly and the rest of it, but it's like 101, it's what you should be doing. If you are looking to come into an area and looking to, to engage with uh, potential customers and businesses, but also the talent pools that are here, getting involved and, and getting grounded in the community, um, be it tech or, or digital or whatever, whatever sort of environment you're looking to, to go into, is really, really important. So some of the, some of the advice I would, I would certainly give, and, and obviously you've been a part of what's going on here for, for a number of years, is in terms of doing the research, but also getting involved, You know, showing up at events, getting involved, speaking opportunities to build that brand, um, awards and things that, that are happening on a sort of local regional level to start to engage and build that employer brand. Um, as well as kind of personal brands, um, the, the, that's one of the biggest challenges for sure. Um, Another point, so I think that's a really good good point on having you know one shot here. But I think for certainly if if we're thinking about companies that are new to the UK that are landing here for the first time, it's a pretty exciting opportunity to mm. to create that from and 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 you know. You might be in a position where um, you know the the you might have had some challenges or pushback from. Um, from candidates in Australia for whatever reason, yeah. you know, the business might have changed dramatically in ten years, and you're still, you know, leaning on some preconceptions of what was before the previous management or something like that. And I think, um, you know, the opportunity to start and build something from from zero is is uh, in, t in terms of like the yeah the, the local awareness of, yeah. of the brand is is quite exciting. I think on that same note, you need to be so many so many businesses we work with are. You know, mapping out what they need to hire, they're sort of, you know, they get the money lands and they're not always prepared then for what that means in terms of investment of time yeah. and to actually land those hires, you know, especially when you're in a really competitive market, you need to be quite smooth with process. Candidate experience is a key factor in that, especially when you're dealing with senior people. Um, you know, some of those, some of those, depending on what you do, some of those candidates might end up being customers in other tech businesses eventually. And, you know, it's a really important thing to make sure that that process is really smooth, whether that be 
through a recruitment partner or whether that be through your internal team and make sure that you've got that that whole thing lined up that you can be be really effective with feedback make sure that that you know every candidate is, is, is coming out of that experience regardless of whether they're successful you know thinking that you're credible and and that will go a long way as well in generating additional interest in, in, in what you're doing yeah absolutely and I think just to kind of reflect on some of those points and one I made earlier as well I think we've um We've certainly seen and understood the difference between the UK talent market and the Australian talent market within technology. Um, we've seen it a couple of times with, with businesses that are coming into the UK. <clears throat> in terms of their employer brand, yes, we speak the same language and we understand each other, but the, the market is different in terms of perception, in terms of um, what UK candidates or, or talent expect from an employer. There are only subtle differences, but there are cultural differences as well in terms of those, uh, you know, in terms of your, your salary, but in terms of your benefits and in terms of what you stand for and your impact, there are differences, cultural differences between the two. Um, and I think that's one thing that really needs to be looked at before you come in and land in the UK. There's a lot to it and there's, there's a lot of moving parts and all the rest of it, but fundamentally, again, you, there, are, there is only one opportunity when, when you land, when you start canvassing for talent and engaging with people like yourselves and with, with candidates. It is all about that experience. So it has to be right from the start um, because it is hugely competitive. And if you want to stand above the crowd without having to pay silly footballer wages, then it's a, it's a worthwhile task for sure. Um, just, just in terms of um, uh, some of the sort of tips and advice, and obviously we, we've talked about sort of geo hotspots and what's going on in the UK and where. If people want to find out information and do their own research um, at home or, or, or at work, where can they go? What sort of things can they, can they be looking at? It's a good question. Um, I mean, just give you a call. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> just just pick up the phone. Yeah. I mean, we, we run. It's it's quite a broad. It's as I said, it's quite a broad. You know, we're covering so many areas, and there's so many different needs. It could yeah. be tech. It could be sales. Could be you know, it, the, the, and depending on technology stack, it varies massively. There's there's quite a surprisingly different amount of available tech people regionally, mm. depending on tech stacks as yeah. well. So when you look at like if any if if you've got a place where there's historically been a really big Microsoft based technology stack, then you've probably got a lot of graduates who would have invested in the Microsoft tech stack to go into those businesses locally. Yeah. And you end up with a bit of a Microsoft hotspot, which can be great if you're Microsoft. But which is Reading as well. It, yeah. yeah. But if you're, um, if you're looking to hire Go engineers or JavaScript, then you, know, you need to maybe make, take a different approach. So yeah. from our side, if, if you do want to uh, you know, reach out and, 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 and get any like, specific information on what you're targeting, we're always keen to, to speak to people. I think from... Um, our regional uh, programs, the investment activator program that yeah. we're both involved in. Um, the there's uh, I forget the name of it. Something Hurst. Oh, Bowhurst. They they provide quite a lot of data insight into into stuff going on. Maybe more around funding rather than yeah. than that. But um, I think for us, we 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 we. we produce a lot of our own I've seen the yeah, that's, 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 to be fair that's actually quite a valid point um, I think ju just in terms of like broad highlights and understanding the UK um, sort of talent market as a whole um, there's a really good annual report Tech Nation's uh, annual report is really really interesting and it goes into kind of those regional hubs in a bit more detail so you can understand uh, size of talent pools who's hiring who's scaling etc it is quite an interesting read it's free uh, so go check out the Tech Nation report um, I, I did definitely put you on the spot there, mate, so, so apologies about that. But some of the work that you do, and obviously I've seen some of these research um, uh, projects that you've done in terms of helping those businesses understand that, that landscape, that's really, really interesting in terms of the, the data that, that you're sort of mining into and understanding those local markets and those conditions. So I think you did some, some great stuff. I won't sort of mention the sort of names, but you've done some great stuff with a, uh, a regional fintech and uh, a couple of other national brands as well in terms of helping businesses actually understand the market and where they should be going. And I think that's a really interesting tool and resource if there are people watching this and thinking, we're going to go to the UK, we're definitely coming, but we don't know where the hell we're showing up. I think it's, it's, it's definitely worthwhile reaching out just for, just for some of those uh, research insights in terms of the landscape because you are right, it's not necessarily just about the vertical you're in, fintech or whatever, it's also about the languages as well, isn't it? So Yeah, 100%. I think from, from our side, so I, 
I am usually tasked with working how working with the business and working out how, how we're gonna deliver it, how yeah. we're gonna where we're we gonna find these people, do they exist? And mapping out that and working with the company to, to get you know to get it over the line. In terms of the stage back from that, um, that usually starts with some level of research and analysis on if it's achievable yeah. and obviously if they're considering multiple locations. We have a talent consultancy arm now, which has got. I think we've we've got. We're, we're quite fortunate. We're a big recruitment company, so we've got a team of about four or five analysts who now offer those services. We just did that for uh, a major retail bank, um, mm-hmm. and, and they were looking at um, places in Europe that they can uh, do their next, like, put their next digital hub for a, for a large offshore plan. Um, and yeah, we, we've we've been involved in, in in supporting them for a three month analysis of, of where they're going to land. So yeah, we we can do it all all different you know from small scale ups to, yep. to, to to big you know corporate FTSE one hundred companies. Um, if if you do want to have a conversation around that, you know we're happy to do that. Cool. So in t- from from your experience as well. So obviously we we've talked about what's going on and sort of conditions of the of the talent market are here and the competitiveness and all the rest of it. Um, how how are you helping businesses in terms of uh, sort of managing that? So again, we just sort of touched on the fact that sort of you know you can just pay a footballer's wage if you want, and it absolutely attracts some of the best talent. That's absolutely fine. But for those that are perhaps not ready to do that or don't want to do that for for a number of different reasons, how what are businesses doing here to to kind of get over that? What sort of things can can you touch on? Yeah, absolutely. So I think you know the salary part, albeit you know you don't want to pay crazy footballer wages to, mm. you know, to, to just lock people in, um, you need to be sensible with that and you do need to be monitoring um, you know, what, what, what the market is doing and, and, and whether people are, are paid, you know, may, maybe not, not necessarily in line with, with the exact current market rate because it is overinflated in certain technology stacks at the moment, but you, know, you need to be rewarding your, your key employees and, and bringing them up um, just to to reduce the risk of, of approaches because I can guarantee that when you, you know, that any, any good technical people are going to be getting multiple messages on LinkedIn probably a day mm. about opportunities. So you need to be proactive in, in getting ahead of that and making sure people are happy. The basic things I think of, of just making sure people are valued, the, the number one thing that always comes up is, is personal development. Yeah. Um, so in, in any of our business, you know, some of the, the uh, exciting businesses, and again, when you look at paying someone, you know, an extra, I don't know, a few thousand pounds on a salary versus paying for them to do a thousand pound AWS certification or however much it might cost, you know, those two things could cost a similar amount of money, but the, 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 the value received from paying someone to go through accreditation, yeah. Is much much more, and and I think that's a consistent thing that we see is that businesses where um, there's a there's a, a one of the biggest um, scale ups at the moment in the fintech space that we, we work with offer uh, on a on a, a Friday afternoon they do um, a learning Friday, mm. so that they they offer their software engineers half half a day on yeah. a Friday afternoon. To, to focus on developing a, a new skill of their choice within the tech stack, yeah, yeah. Um, and that could be you know learning something completely different with, but as long as it's within that internal tech stack, they support them with training and development time with senior engineers and also with accreditation. Yeah, and and I think just building in that that sort of process of having um, the options there to keep learning is is, yeah, is yeah. the key thing. I think if people feel like they're moving forward. You know, they're they're not then going to be looking as, as much outside of yeah, opportunities. Yeah. I think that that sort of culture of learning is really really important, particularly within the technology uh, industry. Um, so I think that's absolutely spot on, and, and we've seen it firsthand as well with businesses that we work with. When you embed that culture of learning, you're always pushing. It's good for the individuals, but it's also good for the momentum of the business as well. They're always pushing. They're always looking forward. In terms of sort of accessing uh, talent in the UK, there's a whole plethora of places you can go. Um, obviously, talent jobs boards. Well, jobs boards uh, as a whole is, is a sensible place to start in terms of when you're advertising opportunities. There are so many ways to, to, to look in terms, so many boards. Um, can you give any advice to companies that are looking to land in the UK in terms of what are the best options for advertising opportunities within a sort of technology business? Yeah, absolutely. So I think in terms of our normal sort of search process, regardless of what we, what we look for, we look across the same platforms and job boards is a, is a big part of that. It's both for if you're proactively searching on job boards for people and if you're posting ads. I think from a tech perspective and digital 
the probably you know we cover a lot, but the, the top ones would be thing, things like CW jobs, total jobs, read, and I think for adverts probably job serve is is number one. Mm -hmm. um, those are the most popular. The, the the one area we have seen a lot of growth and traction, I think just because of the the ease to apply is LinkedIn. Yeah. So LinkedIn jobs now, most people, I would say, especially when you're looking at permanent hires, LinkedIn's probably our number one tool um, for, and has been for a long time. I think that the ease of having a mobile app, pressing open some opportunities or pressing apply, yeah. as opposed to uploading a CV, is a trend that's only going to continue to sort of to, to go that way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would, I would definitely say for any business landing here, you, LinkedIn jobs, I think, are, are quite fairly priced compared to some of the job boards. Only in the last month, I think, some of the job boards have gone up in price. I think mm -hmm. LinkedIn's probably a little bit cheaper now. So yeah, I think LinkedIn's probably number one and then any of those ones I mentioned. Brilliant. And then just, just finally, in terms of uh, LinkedIn, well, obviously we touched on the employer brand, but obviously if that is going to be one of the kind of cornerstone marketplaces, I suppose, where you're going to be advertising opportunities, any tips that you can give in terms of just making sure that you put your sort of best foot forward um, and you're encouraging candidates to follow and to you know find out more information about your business on LinkedIn? Yeah, absolutely. So I think with, with LinkedIn messaging, uh, and I'm more thinking about... So in the current market, adverts are good for certain positions, especially yep. if it's more strategic hires, senior roles, you're gonna probably get some traction on, on adverts with those. If you're looking for software developers, the response rate on, on ads, even if you've got the best ad that's well written, you know, in, in the world, it, it's gonna be in there with thousands of others. Yep. So it's quite hard to, to unless you, you know, you've got some unbelievable, you know, writing skills to, 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 to you know, to pitch something, it's, it's difficult to compete just on ads. Yeah. So I think when you're proactively contacting people on LinkedIn, again, going back to the messaging, um, making sure that there's a little bit of a, a hook in there, and I think this has either got to be delivered really from an internal talent team or from recruitment partners that you're working with, making sure there's a clear you know, hook of the opportunity of what, why this one's interesting, why you should message back on it, and providing that little bit of extra content yeah. rather than just saying, you know, I'm looking for a, a JavaScript engineer, in fintech, anybody in the local area, you know, yeah. paying this much, not a lot of people are gonna are gonna are gonna um, respond to that. I think you, you need to have some hook in there of why you you know why you, um, and if you can get that right on a lot of the messages, they don't have to be very long. Um, but if you can focus more on the company, the opportunity on a message, and obviously you need to include what the job is. I think the hit rate for us goes up quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that will probably be something to think about. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, in terms of uh, today's session, uh, that's it from uh, from this discussion. Uh, myself and Josh will be on the um, on the other end of this this uh, webinar, where we'll be answering questions from uh, everyone who's attended today. So feel free to drop any uh, questions into the chat, and we'll pick them up on the other side, and we'll speak to you then.